Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live. I'm Joe Lynch. It is May 27th, Wednesday. Uh, I am once again joined by City Council President Matt McLaughlin and one of his colleagues here today is Councilor at Large, Will Ba. President McLaughlin, a long Memorial Day weekend. How was it and how are you doing? I was pretty well, you know, we held a uh, brief ceremony at the uh, Veterans Cemetery, tried to keep uh, social distancing while respecting uh, military members who have passed away. Um, so it, it was a decent weekend, all things considered. How, how was your weekend? Very good, restful, little gardening, little around the house, no major gatherings, neighbors are great. They walk up and down the street. I live on a very small street, so we did have our uh, physical distancing and raised, um, I shouldn't say this publicly, but everyone was on their own porch, but we raised a glass to each other. Um, uh, a glass council of great juice. Councilor Ba, how are things in the western part of the city? Uh, Joe, we are doing okay too. Uh, trying to stay positive, you know, as long as uh, we have food to eat, we can do groceries, you know, I think that is where, you know, uh, We've decided to be, you know, thankful. And then I take the kids out, you know, we go to the driveway, do some little bit of soccer, play a little bit, you know, come back, do some puzzle, and, you know. Yeah, it was a low key weekend and some reflection as well. But that was about it. And and how are the kids loving dad being home all the time? Oh, Joe, I think uh, they are loving it, you know, so, they like it a lot, but they don't understand the impact that it's having on us in terms of productivity. So, uh, yeah, it's good. It's a good time, you know, but it's also very challenging. You are going to have some explaining to do when things get back to semi-normal and you have to go back to a semi-normal routine about why aren't you home every day? That's true. Well, we're going we're gonna to shoot this back over to Matt McLaughlin. Matt? Council update from uh, you had your meeting last night because of the holiday. Yes. Um, so, you know, as of today, uh, you know, 864 Somerville residents have tested positive for COVID-19. Now, there's been 628 people have recovered and there are currently 25 deaths in Somerville. Uh, the city recently announced its phase reopening, uh, which is a little bit longer than the state's plan. Uh, but some of it will remain on its previously established schedule to resume construction. Uh, houses of worship will continue to be limited to no more than 10 people at a gathering. And hair salons and barber shops will reopen in early June after further construct after further consultation with local owners to ensure safe practices. Uh, you know, on May 18th, the city opened it up for limited construction as well as hospital work and houses of worship. Uh, May 25th, uh, they did curbside retail, so retail stores could sell uh, without letting people in the building, and the Department of uh, DCR Parks were opened up on May 25th. Uh, and then on June 1st, the next date for us, uh, manufacturing will be allowed to be open in lab and office space, pack rooming by appointment, car washing, um, and other items like that, so things that have less person-to-person -person contact, but uh, you know they still want to open up. Uh, recreation areas in Somerville will remain closed until further notice, just like the city's public buildings. Um, early June, uh, they will be rolling out a, a barbershop and hair salon by appointment only uh, after consultation with the Department of Public Health. Uh, we also have the city announced its Safe Streets initiative recently, uh, where a lot of cities in America and across the world are doing this now. They're, closing roads uh, for pedestrian use to uh, encourage social distancing. And that's going to roll out uh, in the East Somerville and Winter Hill neighborhoods, uh, Glen Street in East Somerville and Jake Street in Winter Hill. And the idea is that they both are paths you can take directly to the supermarket. So this isn't really about recreation as much as it is just walkability and people's ability to get from place to place without coming near each other. Uh, and in non-COVID related news, but very positive development, uh, the Washington Street Bridge is going to be open on May 31st. It's been closed for quite a while uh, due to GLX construction, but that bridge will be open on May 31st, which really opens up the East Somerville neighborhood. Um, and then the Broadway Bridge is going to be open the first week of June. 
so those are good positive developments uh, as a result of the construction that kept going. So um, at least we have that. And that's all I have for you, Joe. Thank you, Matt. You know, in, in, between, um, in between the storms, every now and then the sun peeks through. And I think, um, you know, as we see the death toll climb in the city, it's a, a tragic reminder to all of us that the virus is still here, the virus is still infecting people, and that we all need to be extremely, extremely careful. But in between those storms, we have the ray of sunshine, which is for some of those uh, businesses in the Magoon Square, Ball Square, and Washington Street area, um, reopening of those bridges is truly a ray of sunshine for them because um, it means more people will be able to walk directly to their places of business. Uh, with the businesses reopening, um, that seems to be something that we can delve into a little later, but I wanted to mention, um, you know, the bridges reopening, the green line is still on track, work still continues. Um, so some of that is good news amidst what we've been uh, faced with. Let me go back to both of you and Will, if you wanna take it first on the shared streets part of it. So as more and more people are trying to physically keep their distance, as you know, most of the sidewalks in the city are not wide enough for people to traverse and keep six feet apart. Um, so as part of that initiative, we're starting a pilot program here called Shared Streets which is some retail may be able to um, widen their path, so to speak, um, and expand their, maybe, I don't know yet, expand their outdoor seating, and to give pedestrians and bicyclists more of the road so that they can um, freely walk and freely bike without fear of vehicles uh, zooming up and down the street. I don't have that exactly right, but if you want to kind of take it over a little bit about shared streets, either one, Will or Matt. Well, you can go ahead. Yeah, no, uh, thank you, Joe. Before I even uh, mention the shared street uh, talk, uh, I first of all just want to thank the, the good president for having me here with you once again, Joe. It's really an honor. And also, I just wanted to uh, highlight, you know, like a few things, you know, that from the update that uh, President McLaughlin made, we should also uh, know that most of the people impacted has been our most vulnerable population, especially the seniors, you know, so it's, they've really been hit hard with this, uh, uh, this virus. So if you know some seniors, you know, like try to reach out to them, check in on them, because the, those are the, that's actually the main numbers that have been counted. The rest, like between 60, 70 to 79, it's been a, a, a huge chunk, and then above 80, it's been another chunk. But below that, the numbers are really insignificant. So like below five. Uh, yeah, so about Shell Street, I think it's a great concept. You know, my, our roads are underutilized during this time, and we want to get out. You know, we are rolling our policies, you know, and. So in order for people to buy in some of these policies, we can also like create a, an environment where they can all, you know, be able to be out and take air and why social, social distancing. So I think it's a good concept. We need to have more buy-in from the neighborhoods because this is mostly in residential streets. So I think it's overall, it's a good start, but we need to have more buy-in from community members. What kind of what kind of pushback what kind of pushback are we getting? I, I follow some of the blogs and some of the media sites. Um, we're getting slight pushback from folks saying this is the wrong way to approach this. Um, do, do either of you get a sense from your constituents on is it the majority of folks who want to see this type of program and that the loudest voices are the opposition? Or, or are people not understanding what shared streets is yet? Matt? Yes, to all of it. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it, it's a real mixed bag. I mean, I think 
you know, there, there was a strong activist contingent uh, internationally. A lot of people are looking to go this direction anyways. Um, you know, before the pandemic, this was kind of an initiative from a lot of people. So uh, it's a continuation of that. And, you know, I have Glen Street in my neighborhood, uh, which is uh, what I will say positively. Uh, the city decided to roll out these uh, shared street initiatives in the neighborhoods most heavily impacted. Uh, so that is West East Somerville and Winter Hill. Uh, so that is a positive thing. Uh, I did get immediate pushback from uh, at least one Glen Street resident who wasn't informed about it. And unfortunately, I wasn't very well informed on it either, uh, despite the fact I was asking for several weeks for this information. Uh, I would have liked a lot more input because I had ideas of other streets, uh, such as Washington Street is the best example. They were about to open that bridge up this week. And I would love to see a lane in Washington Street be dedicated to uh, shared streets because we want less traffic on that street anyways. Uh, there's the Cobble Hill Senior Center right there. It'd be perfect for walking. And it gets you right to Sullivan Square. So sometimes these top-down decisions are made um, to appease people who are demanding that this happen, but they don't talk to the entire neighborhood. Um, so I think generally it's a positive development. Uh, but it's also, you need to inform people, especially when it affects their street. Yeah, I'll just make one comment on, on something that I read on one of the blogs. And Matt, both Will and you know, sometimes you have to take these things with a grain of salt, but it did appear there was um, a rush to do this and that certain folks were not notified. Um, and one of the words that came to mind was, it's an opportunistic move by the city to push an agenda. I, I happen to disagree that it was opportunistic because I've followed this for a while. I think it's something that the city has been talking about. Um, and during COVID, you know, communication to the masses is going to be critical because changes happen so fast. Uh, changes happen that impact a lot more people. So I would just encourage the city itself to be a lot more communicative when it comes to initiating these types of programs. Um, well, Joe, the budget. I, I would Let's go. I'll just add to that real yeah, quick, no, Joe. That. Uh, you know, I, I would. I, oh, go ahead, Will. I would say just, no, just no, no, no. I just really wanted quickly, to. Um, I don't. I don't think that uh, it was rolled out very quickly. I don't think that it was a spontaneous thing because we've been hearing about this for what is what's this my eighth interview with you now uh we've heard about it for the past eight weeks or so so the city wasn't quick to roll it out uh but i will say it was a reaction to demands uh and then when the decision was made uh the neighborhood wasn't informed well enough so that's the the communications part like you say is the part that needs to be fixed i wouldn't say that this is an opportunistic move at all though well so I just wanted to add that there's a lot of conspiracy theory going on around the city on different things and policy issues. So, but yeah, there wasn't a lot of uh, collaboration because usually it's a good concept, but if you don't have a buy-in from the community that you're trying to serve, it's almost like you're shoveling, you know, telling them this is good for you or something and that we don't need your input. So there's always ways to optimize something like that. Well, communication is going to be the key. I think it's the uh, heightened awareness that people have of, uh, last week I happened to have the uh, clinical psychologist from Cambridge Health Alliance on, and one of the key things she was citing was that a lot of people feel like they are not in control of what's happening to their own lives during COVID. And I think it becomes critical for those of us in the media, those of you in government, have to communicate clearly and effectively to the populace as to what's going on. So, I, Matt, I tend to agree with you. I've followed shared streets. I understand what the concept is. I understand why they're doing it. Um, and, and quite frankly, in my neighborhood, uh, there's a lot of agreement that, you know, this is a perfect opportunity when you have less vehicles to launch something like this and see how it works. Let's move on to the budget for a moment. Matt McLaughlin was talking about it last week. Um, do we have an update, Matt, as far as uh, when you folks are gonna start discussing the budget and how long that will take? 
Well, Will was in the finance committee meeting last night, so maybe he can discuss this. But uh, the short answer is uh, we're hoping to get it soon because uh, they expect us to vote on it by late June. And usually this takes an entire month and we're almost in June now. I think the uh, chair, JT Scott, wanted uh, to have a public hearing by June 9th and the city doesn't think that's going to happen. So we're looking at mid-June right now, um, hopefully. But uh, Will, you were in on that meeting. Maybe he can discuss it more. Yeah, uh, thank you uh, for that. I think, yes, I, I have the opportunity and the privilege to sit on finance. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's, so nothing is really set in stone right now. Everything is dynamic. It's a lot of fluid communication. And uh, so they said they will, present the budget to us between June 8th and June 12th. Uh, and so I was actually encouraging the chair of finance to start preparing to schedule like a public hearing, just so that, you know, community members can also be informed and know how things are moving and that he can always still change that date, but it's good to have every community member participate, you know, in this process because this is going to be like the most controversial budget ever. It's the most consequential, you know, that we are trying to vote on. So having community input and just like how uh, uh, President McLaughlin had even uh, brought the initial concept of the people's budget. So we want to hear from community members what they care about, what they are thinking as far as, you know, like the city's, you know, finances is concerned. We welcome their input during this critical time. And I, I must say that, for example, I know that some jobs might be gone for good. And so we need to start answering those questions. What does that mean? You know, how do we create a system to help people, you know, continue to reduce transmission, keep them housed, feed them, you know, and so on. So this is, those are my, my things I'm looking at as far as the budget is concerned, making sure that there's no layoffs in the city. And also, most importantly, I'll be prioritizing living wage for our paraprofessionals who are the, you know, like the least paid work employees by the city. Let, let me put the hard question to both of you. How likely is it that when you get into this budget that you will not be making cuts to city positions? Hmm. Well, I mean, that's a difficult question when you haven't seen the budget. Um, so, you know, we're, we're looking, uh, for people who don't know, actually, because I didn't know this before I was a city councilor, um, you know, the city council's only power with the budget is to make cuts or you can vote it down completely. Uh, you can't add money, you can't reallocate money to different positions. Uh, so the only power you have is cuts. So the mayor is going to come up with a proposed budget. Uh, we don't know what sort of cuts are going to be in that already. And then the city council has the ability to make cuts. And I think we've always taken that seriously. I take that seriously. Uh, you know, trying to save the people some money uh, where we can. And now we're in a really extreme situation. So we're gonna have to see what happens. Uh, I will see, we'll, we will see once we get the budget, um, what sort of cuts people propose. And it requires six votes to make a cut and then we need to approve the budget or reject it. Council Barr. What do you think? No, uh, thank you, Joe. And I think uh, President McLaughlin answered eloquently. Me personally, when I look at this budget, you know, I will be asking just questions like, is this necessary? You know, what is, like, what is this for? Like, can we do without this and that and stuff like that? And also being cognizant that I will not, you know, like try to, you know, like stifle the city's progress, you know, like just cut you know, uh, randomly just because for the sake of cutting. So it has to be a very thoughtful process, you know, looking at line and like, what is, why is this, is this necessary? Have you, you, you allocated this amount of money for the past four years and you never even used it. So why are you, why is this still here? You see what I mean? So those yeah. are like some questions that, you know, yes, it, it will be a very conservative budget that I can assure you. Let, let me put the offer on the table. I, I offered uh, J.T. Scott, who is chair of the Finance Committee, I offered to him, if you want to send me that budget, I can make start making cuts and take the heat off of all of you. How's that? 
Well, it's a public document, Joe, so you're welcome to do that. And well, I'll share, share those notes with me. I, I know exactly which departments to cut. Um, so let's go on to some other things that are coming up. Um, we're heading into the final stretch of the month of May. The good weather is finally here. Uh, restaurants uh, are itching to reopen. Realistically, um, the governor is now allowing certain types of restaurants moving forward, certain types of restaurants to expand um, their services, not only delivery and pickup, but there will be certain restaurants uh, moving forward into the month of June. When do we anticipate that the mayor will then follow with a little bit more relaxing for those folks, for the restaurants? Do we know? Well, the, the latest update is no sooner than early June. So they, they've left out restaurant seating uh, as part of their announcements just now. Um, and if I could circle back just on the safer streets part of it too, with the outdoor seating uh, as a connection. Um, people should think that, you know, as, we, as we've learned uh, through our president and the state government, you know, the government doesn't always know what they're doing or they, they don't always know what's best for the individual. And I think people are getting this message that because, you know, the government says you can now do this, it's something you should flock to just going to do. Um, and I think people should still, whether it's the safe streets or outdoor seating or anything, still take the precautions necessary, wear a mask, wash your hands, try to keep six feet from people, uh, because just because we close the streets down and make it easier for people doesn't make you safe from COVID-19. Uh, so that, that's something I want to get across to people. I'm glad to see this phase reopening. We have to get back to business at some point, but I personally will wash my hands more than I ever have uh, my entire life. Uh, I'll be doing that for the rest of my life now and, you know, being cautious of people when they cough or something like this. Uh, so people should still exercise those cautions. But the, to answer your question, uh, we don't know exactly when the restaurants are going to be open yet. So, so I have a follow up question for either one of you. Assume for a minute that we do go back into a very slow, very cautious, very protocol laden reopening. Do we have enough inspectors and enough folks that are going to be uh, inspecting these places, making sure that they take care of the protocols that are in place? Well, in my mind, we've never had enough inspectors, um, but I do think that what inspectors we do have will be prioritized towards this. So if anything, we'll be missing out on other services uh, that aren't as essential. Uh, so I think we, we, the city's taking it very seriously now, whenever I call, about a business uh, that's not obey following protocol. Uh, the ISD gets right on top of it and the public health department. Uh, so I think they'll, we'll be taking it seriously, but unfortunately other services may be affected. And, and Joe, if I may, you know, I, as far as uh, uh, reopening is concerned, you know, I think it's like President McLaughlin said, it's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, transmission still happening. Because even though we have uh, uh, the state is, is, has a number of 100,000, you know, uh, infected cases, the actual number is, is in order of magnitude. It's about a million, you know. So what does that mean, you know? So which means it means that, you know, as we are thinking about reopening, we should be thinking about testing, you know, thinking about jobs that are safe and unsafe to return to work, you know. There's all this little pieces that we want to make sure and not just also restaurant i myself i want to in like i want to go back to work but at the same time if i don't have child care how do i you know like go to work so it's like it's a big deal for me you know like to to have child care so how do we empower and support the most affected communities as we are thinking about reopening because people in underserved communities are suffering like immigrants the elderly you know the working class so there are a lot of, you know, like things that we need to look at it from a big picture perspective, not just, you know, single out one, you know, particular sector. And then, so it all encompasses like everybody else. Yes, we uh, uh, provided a million dollars, you know, for small loans for small businesses, but that's not enough. You know, there are people that the government, that is the state and the federal government have left behind. So how do we help those people? So it's, uh, yeah, so it's a simple question. 
but it's a lot of uh, it's a comprehensive thought process you know not just restaurants you know in, in um, and moving forward will i couldn't agree with you more i mean how do you get people back to work at restaurants if they're worried about child care for their kids how do you get people back to work in the office buildings of boston if they don't want to take public transportation and they revert back to taking their private vehicles into Boston. Now you've added to the congestion and you have an enormous amount of frustration already built up during the 11 weeks, the 12 weeks of our um, COVID pandemic. Now you're asking people to shift their behavior once again. And I, I think it's a huge puzzle that every single one of us are gonna have to fit our piece into that puzzle to make this thing work. One question I want to go back to, and Matt, you may know the answer to this. It, it just came across my email on the phone wanting to know if the buses will be restored when the bridges open. So the, right now the bus lines have been detoured and rerouted. Do we know the answer to that and how fast they're going to restore the regular bus lines? No, I don't know the date of that, but I'm certain that it'll happen because um, we've been waiting for that. I personally have been waiting for the Washington Street bus to be back. Uh, so I don't have the answer for that, though. All right. Tell you what, to the emailer, we'll find out, and uh, hopefully I can give an answer. At 2 o'clock this afternoon, we have the school committee and the uh, superintendent's office coming in. So hopefully we can have an answer. I, I just want to thank, you know, time flies, Will. Will, you should talk Matt into letting you come on alone so you can get all 28 minutes. <laughs> I, I would love that, that Joe. Bro. I would love that because I haven't even, you know, like spoken about like just the fact that there are 98% of Massachusetts workers that are, you know, in short. And yet this is an indication. Look at how hard Massachusetts has been hit. So it's an indication of a broken system. Will, it's not going to be the last time you appear on the show, I guarantee you. So for Somerville Media Center Live, I'm Joe Lynch. I want to thank for, uh, Council President Matt McLaughlin and Councilor at Large Will Ba. Thank you, gentlemen, both. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Joe. For Somerville Media Center, please stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you next time.